raise a hand so far. It's good to know after we have a break that this still works. You know, um, people have been bringing it left and right. You guys have been doing your job. Have to thank you guys. It's been awesome. Um, <clears throat> the next speaker is a friend of ours, homeboy from right down the street here in Lexington. And, um, and if you're in the, <clears throat> if you're American, you should know who he is, first of all. <laughs> but if you're kind of in the military gun world, like, you know who Kyle Carpenter is. Um, uh, he'll tell a little bit of his story, but he's one of those guys that I could only hope to be on my best day what this gentleman has done. Um, so one day, I was leaving SHOT Show, <clears throat> coming out from Las Vegas, I'm on a plane, and uh, <clears throat> get on the plane, I kind of get in there, and this lady sitting beside me, and this, this guy's sitting there, and she's kind of like overhanging, I'm like, holy crap, that's Kyle Carpenter. Like, oh, sweet, I was like, act ah, cool. I don't know how to act, I was just like. <laughs> 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 and so he's, and I was like, ah, and I was kind of like trying to do like the. <laughs> and finally, I'm like, hey, uh, and hey, you know, gave you, I hate to even say the obligatory, thank you for your service. But I did, and I shook his hand. He was like, oh, yeah, cool. And I was introduced myself. He's like, hi, I'm Kyle. I'm like, yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> and, and, um, and I was like, and, and out of nowhere, he had this like little pouch, and he unzips it, and he hands me the Congressional Medal of Honor in the plane. And I'm like, and, and he literally goes, you'll probably find it more interesting than I do. And he literally went to sleep on his mom's shoulder for like hours. And I'm sitting there like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? <laughs> and I'm sitting in a plane. I'm like, okay, this is like stolen valor as it gets. I'm literally holding the guy's medal of honor. And I'm like, ah. Uh. And he wakes up. I'm like, hey, man, here you go. Cool. And so we like hang out a little bit at baggage claim. I'm like, oh, that was rad. And then years and years later, we, we meet up again and uh, became friends since then and have, and have hung out. And he's just... Uh, He's as advertised. He's everything you would hope an American and a, and a person would be. And we've asked him for a few times to come and hang out with us at Summer Strong. A few years ago, he came, and he was watching. He was standing over there, and he was like, hey, do you think I could speak at this sometime? I'm like, yeah, let me talk to my manager and like, see, <laughs> see who we could get. But yes, yes, you, yes. So he was supposed to be here last year, but the cool part was, unlike a fair weather friend that's like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then, you know, like the, the opportunity passes and they kind of whatever. Well, he was one of the first people we called again and say, hey, like, you still in? He's like, absolutely, I'm still in. I wouldn't miss it. I'm like, sweet. So I don't want to steal any of his thunder. I just want to make sure that you guys understand how pumped up I am right now. <laughs> so this is Kyle Clark. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Uh, What you don't know is I slipped Bert a 20 to say all that about me <laughs> before I got up here. Um, I was going to start, be a little dramatic with it, uh, but, you know, in case I got too into things and I forgot the thank yous at the end, I would be kicking myself all the way back home to Charlotte. So, um, to the Sorenex, I won't even say organization, I'll say family. Uh, Bert, your family, uh, but all of you um, in the Bosco Brotherhood, um, people coming for the first time. Uh, I mean, it's really incredible. I mean, Bert and, and your organization I mean, look what you've done. All of these incredible people from different walks of life, from um, different adversities in life. Um, it's powerful. And to get this many great people uh, in a room that you know, just as much as they want to see themselves succeed, you know, they want to see others around them succeed. It's a very beautiful thing. And so I... I'm sincerely 
honored and humbled to be here. And I'm, I'm thankful when 10 middle schoolers will listen to me, much less a room like this. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever had a, a second floor balcony looking down either. Um, and uh, what a way to come out of 15 months of really no engagements and, uh, you know, save Sam getting really thrown back into it. But, uh, you know, also, before I begin, let's give everyone, yourselves included, a round of applause. We made it through a year, and we all had our struggles, but we're here, we're on the up and up, and, um, you know, I'm proud of all of you. So today, tonight, is really just going to be a collection of stories uh, from my um, long, many dark and difficult nights, uh, but ultimately beautiful journey that I've been on these past 11 years. Uh, in the first, I was talking to someone about this, uh, a uh, sore necks and summer strong veteran and I was saying yeah I think I'm just gonna you know get into this he's like well dude you gotta say something about yourself you gotta tell a story or tell people what happened and I'm like okay you know I can do that so um, my name is Kyle Carpenter and I want to start out where my journey of self-discovery really began and that is on a hot, dusty rooftop in Marj, Afghanistan. November 21st, 2010, uh, I laid face down, body still smoking, according to official reports. <laughs> body still smoking, um, and I was extremely confused. I didn't know what had happened. And as I struggled through the disoriented pieces, I felt, uh, and keep in mind I was very confused, but this will allude to Marines' humor with each other. I thought in this banged up state I was in, my buddies were messing with me and pouring warm water all over me. I thought, man, this is so strange. Why would they be pouring warm water all over me? And that last uh, final scary and, again, confusing piece allowed the other ones to fall into place. And I realized that it was not warm water that I was profusely bleeding out. I knew with how I felt, with, unfortunately, the casualties I had seen so far on that deployment, and with the uh, basic medical training that we get as Marines uh, before we deploy, I knew uh, that my time was inevitably limited. I just turned 21 while crawling through a field with a machine gun on my back roughly a month earlier, wondering, am I ever going to get my first cold legal beer? Uh, and, um, you know, I thought that was it. At 21 years old, I began to get extremely tired. The warm water was on every inch of my body. And knowing that was it, I used my final few seconds to think about what was important. And this wasn't a conscious effort. This just came to me. I thought about my family. Uh, specifically my mom and how devastated that she was going to be when she received the news that I did not make it home or that knock on the door or the car in the driveway. And then I said a quick prayer for forgiveness and anything or for anything I had done wrong in my life. And I faded from the world and consciousness for what I thought was the last time. Uh, 
And along with that story, you know, the first lesson that I want to talk about is something all of you are uh, very well aware of, and that is that our time is limited. Life is extremely finite. It's fragile. It's here and gone, you know, in the grand scheme of things, in the blink of an eye. And so you know that. But I want you to really think about, uh, you know, when a tiredness that I can't even describe consumed me deep down to my core, and I, I couldn't fight it even if I wanted to. And the crazy thing was, I didn't fight it. I didn't, I didn't want to. It just, it came, and um, I couldn't escape it. And, you know, this next part is heavy, and, and we'll get to... Uh, a lighter story here in a second, but when the lights went out, you know, they went out, and it was beyond, I, I can't describe it, it was beyond a darkness. It was the darkest of voids. So, you know, with that said, I want to encourage you to live your life every single day if it takes thinking about every few minutes how, again, finite but extremely beautiful this journey is and this journey that you've been given and this opportunity you have. You know, live your life so that when you get to those final moments and the darkness inevitably closes in, you don't wish for more time. You don't want more time. You don't need more time because you've used your time in your life accordingly for others. And you've made the most of it. Obviously, uh, from that story, you know, I had been knocked down um, in one of the worst ways, in my opinion, at least. <laughs> uh, and I didn't think I was ever going to be able to make it back up. Over the next seven days, and, you know, this was kick-started by the quick response and the love and care, the sincere love and care from my fellow Marines and my Navy corpsmen. But over the next seven days, I was um, shuffled through three combat trauma hospitals, stabilized in Germany before the eight, roughly eight-hour flight uh, back over to the United States. And, um, you know, the second you land on the East Coast, it's pretty wild. I mean, I don't remember any of this. I was definitely still unconscious, but, you know, they put you on essentially an 18-wheeler that's been outfitted to be a mobile hospital. And the moment you land, you're taken off the plane, put on that, and police escort through the gates of Walter Reed. My family was there to will me in, even though I was, you know, could have been described as unrecognizable. They asked my mom to bring any pictures or, you know, impressions from the dentist or orthodontist growing up so they could somewhat know what I looked like before to start the reconstructive process. And uh, roughly five weeks later, to my very, very pleasant and happy surprise, I woke up. And uh, the first thing I saw was bright red Christmas stockings that my mom had hung on my hospital room wall to decorate for the holidays. Just in time for presents, perfect. <laughs> and so, um, 
you know, although uh, it was a great thing to wake up, you know, that began to fade when I started to learn about the injuries that I had sustained. Shrapnel, multiple pieces uh, were lodged in my brain. They took a few out, a few still in there. I lost my right eye. My eardrums were blown out. Uh, most of my teeth had been blown out. Uh, my lower jaw had been blown off, so everything was just, you know, to the best of their ability, kind of put together just to start the healing. Thankfully, they had... Um, repaired my collapsed right lung, and uh, let's just say my arms were struggling. <laughs> but even though I woke up with those injuries, it was almost impossible to be down. I mean, there was extreme pain. There was doubt. There was, you know, am I going to even, you know, make it to tomorrow? But I was still here. I was almost in a, uh, you know, perpetual state of um, just thankfulness that nothing else could really even uh, get to me, at least temporarily. You know, it was tough going through the bandage changes and all of that. But, I mean, after that, it was just impossible to escape. I'm still here. No matter what, I'm still here. I can't believe it because all I could remember were those final seconds on the roof where I knew that was it. And in addition to that, I knew that people were feeding off of me. I knew that my family was suffering through that pain and uh, the hurt that I was going through and the worry. I knew that my doctors, the ones with families of their own, children of their own, those that were changing my bandages at 10 p.m. and every day still somehow were back at the hospital at 4.30 doing rounds and making sure I was okay. The corpsmen, Navy corpsmen and the Army medics that sat with me through the long dark hours of the night on a one-to-one, -one, just watching my machines, making sure they didn't go out of range, or you know, I, I continued breathing. And so even if I was to get down temporarily, you know, I knew that the better I did, the better they were doing. So just like in life or in the hospital, we tell people we're good. We say we're good. We stay strong for our families, the ones we love, the ones surrounding us. And, you know, maybe in that moment, that was true. But ultimately, it was a lie. And lies like that, saying that you're good when you're not. Many times, those you know, seemingly, hey, I'm okay, I don't even want to talk about it in the moment, moments will lead to those low moments and those dark times. And so I tell that to say, very shortly after is when my moment came. I stayed at Walter Reed for almost two months, and the last roughly month and a half of my immediate life-saving kind of inpatient type period was spent at a polytrauma unit in Richmond, Virginia. I went down there after I got off of my trach. 
uh, all of my machines. And, you know, when I was essentially stable, they pushed me down to Richmond to make room for others that obviously needed that uh, immediate and intense care. I completed my time at Richmond and uh, myself, my family, and the Marine Corps um, chain of command at Walter Reed, they knew my family, they had got to know them during my recovery time. And at this time, I should have gone back up to Walter Reed, but there were so many casualties coming in. I'll never forget, before I went down to Richmond, they were wheeling me out on a, on a uh, stretcher and I remember seeing a couple beds in the hallway. You know, thankfully, uh, these service members were not injured that bad and they could kind of just you know, receive the couple days care, whatever they needed, and uh, they didn't need that inside the room intense care. But still, they were out in the hallway. So with that said, there was a new um, wounded warrior um, housing building that was opening up in September. This was very end of February, early March of that year. So my family and I, we made an agreement with the chain of command that I could go home right here to Lexington as long as I went to therapy every day and every week to two weeks, my beautiful saint of a mother uh, would drive me back up to Walter Reed to DC Minimum eight hours, could be 11 or 12, uh, depending on how you hit Richmond traffic. And uh, my mom will be the first one to tell you that I was awake for maybe one out of those 2,000 hours <laughs> we were in the car. Um, but like an amazing mother, you know, she did that for me. But with that said, I was at home. And uh, I don't, I, it was a very short time before this occurred but it had been a long day of therapy, obviously healing, and I was in the very early stages. And it was around 9.30, 10 at night, and I decided to be a badass Marine and attempt the monumental task of making a bowl of cereal. <laughs> now, at this time, obviously my arms, I hadn't had any of my nerve graft surgeries. This one was still you know, healing from 30 fractures. The milk was only half full, but weighed 100 pounds. Even the box was somewhat difficult. I accomplished the task after a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I had accomplished the task, and then it came time to enjoy it. And uh, I couldn't have planned this low moment any better. The Kitchen lights were dim. I was sitting there by myself trying to eat this bowl of cereal. And to say I was failing was an understatement. I, and I, the nerves had been severed in my face, but I could tell I was not being a clean eater with that bowl of cereal. I could tell milk was going everywhere. I couldn't really even chew because I only had two teeth left on the bottom. And now I realized because I had tried to stay so strong and also that moment, I, I didn't even realize that in the moment, but that was the first time it was just me, myself, and I, and my thoughts, no noise, nothing else going on, just me sitting there. For the first time really, definitely since the hospital, but for the first time since joining the Marine Corps. And I completely broke, completely. I went from perfectly fine, well, pretty much perfectly fine, to in that moment, I completely broke in half. And I started crying and uh, you know, it intensified and my mom rushed in, threw her arms around me, you know, what's hurting, what's hurting? And, um, you know, I just looked up at her, and I choked out, look at me, who's ever gonna love me again? And I think a lot of times we look back and we regret things or we wish we'd done something different, 
but you have to realize you are where you are and who you are because of all of those moments. Some of the great ones, yeah, but mostly the adversity. And I probably have from the medication, I don't know how I had this insight, but as I was sitting there continue, continuing to break down, I didn't snap out of it, but I had this thought, and I realized that the past is truly the past. And no matter what has happened, whether it was one second ago, five years ago, I or any of you will never be able to change what happened, to go back, to do it differently. And so I realized that when you get knocked down in life or blown up, uh, you really only have two choices. And this is, you know, this is a, a difficult you know, lesson to, uh, to take in. But you really only have two choices. Cut out all the options you think you have. Cut out the noise. And when you face that adversity, you can either get up, and take that small step forward, or you will sit at that kitchen counter for the rest of your life. You don't have to have a perfect plan. You don't have to know where you're going. You don't even have to know exactly who you are. That is life, that is the journey. In that moment, you are becoming different, for better or worse. So you don't have to know everything. You just have to take that small step forward. And that moment of clarity that I'm forever grateful that I had allowed me to accomplish a very uh, unrealistic goal that I had set for myself a few months before. After I woke up, my arms were tied up to the bed for swelling. Someone one time was like, dude, they tied you up to the bed? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but my arms are pretty banged up. So I was tied up, propped up, uh, and in that low physical, mental, and emotional state, again, unrealistic, and it was just internal. I never voiced this to anyone. I just thought to myself, and what is something I could do or begin or work towards, whether it's a year from now or 10 years from now, that if I accomplish, I could know inside, deep down inside, that I was not just still Kyle and I was not just still hanging in there and with it, but that I was even better than I was before. And I thought, maybe I'll attempt a marathon one day. And a lot of people will say, you know, oh, you spent three years in the hospital, and, uh, you know, you have 40-something surgeries, and, you know, how did you do all that, and how did you not get overwhelmed? And, you know... Maybe I did at times. Who wouldn't get tired of continuously being wheeled into another surgery, sitting there at 4.30 in a freezing cold hospital room with a nightgown on and, you know, your mom's unfortunately seeing your rear end every week and a half sitting there. And, uh, you know, that, yeah, of course that got old. But I'm so thankful that, I mean, now, I might not have said it then, but I'm so thankful that it was so much and it was so intense because it forced me to take those small, continuous steps. I had to, whether I wanted to or not, I had to go to therapy every single day. But when I went to therapy, I could choose, do I want to give a half-assed effort 
or do I want to try to make this nerve connect to this nerve a couple days quicker? And so it forced me, so I, 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 I think just going through it, I didn't even realize how amazing it was at the time, but these little steps started to, uh, you know, the momentum started to pick up, and then those turned into somewhat bigger steps. And I realized that, hey, after I get my arms untied, if I can sit up in the bed, I can work on hanging my feet off the edge of my bed. If I can hang my feet off the edge of my bed, I can work on standing. If I can stand, I can take a step. If I can take a step, I can walk. If I can walk, I can run. And if I can run, one day I can attempt that marathon. Today, I've crossed that finish line three times. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Today I've crossed that finish line three times, and I couldn't have done that if I didn't get up from that kitchen counter. And when I crossed the finish line of that marathon, I started tearing up just because I had survived it, one, but two, I proved to myself that all of those lessons I was trying to continuously almost just lie to myself until I believed it, I proved to myself that they were true. And even more important than that, I knew that in that moment, I had so much more ammunition to tell people, hey, you can do this too. Whether you crawl across, whether you're in a hand cycle, whether you, you know, handstand, walk the whole way. No matter how it is, no matter how you have to adapt, no matter how bad it hurts, I promise you not only can your mind and body take far more than you ever can imagine until you have to, but crossing that finish line taught me one of the greatest lessons I carry with me today, and uh, my favorite line from my book, and that is that the smallest of steps eventually completes the grandest of journeys. One of uh, the last lessons and thing I, things I want to talk about is a word, it was mentioned earlier today, and that guy, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, man, but you were incredible. Red Polo, helping Jay, shout out Jay. Hey, Dan, you're the man, that was awesome. But he mentioned this word, and this word is arguably the reason that I am able, I am who I am now, but I am able to stand in front of you and talk to you here tonight. And that is perspective. And I just cannot emphasize how important and vital and essential and fill in the blank on any word like that perspective is. Perspective allows us to Realize and truly appreciate the silver linings and blessings of life. Perspective allows us to continually search for those silver linings. And ultimately, perspective shapes our reality. And I want to tell you uh, a quick story, 
and that is about my man, Kenny. 2016, I was a junior here at University of South Carolina. I had left a business meeting downtown, and I was dressed pretty sharp, in my very humble opinion. <laughs> and my man, Kenny, seemed to think so, too. I was walking down the sidewalk, and I passed him and what seemed to be his friend. And they also, uh, you know, no judgment or anything, but they just seemed to be at face value homeless. And clearly, Kenny did not know my history because he shot me a finger pistol, and uh, he said, hey, looking sharp, brother. And I'm always open and honest when I talk, and I always kind of cringe when I have to talk about this part, and I regret to say that uh, I prepared for the follow-up question of Kenny asking me for money after a compliment like that. But nothing else was said. And so I kept walking, and every step was just a little harder and heavier to take forward. And I got to my car door, I opened it, threw my, threw my papers inside, but I just could not get in. I had to go back, hopefully he was there, and shake Kenny's hand and tell him that, you know, I, I really did appreciate not just the comment, but the happiness. You know, he had a smile from ear to ear. The happiness that he shared with me in that moment, as down and out as he was. So I went back, and uh, his buddy had left. I would have loved to hang out with both of them, but thankfully Kenny was still there. So I sat down and I started talking to him. And uh, you know, this, this isn't the point of the story, and I kind of just thought about this, but uh, you know, that was one of multiple moments along my journey where I, whether it was Kenny being homeless, whether it was gang members in DC, That moment showed me that no matter where we had come from, no matter our past, how we got to where we were sitting on that sidewalk, our struggle is what bridged us. Our scars on our body were for different reasons. He told me a couple stories of how he got his, you know, and the, the difficult life it was growing up on the streets. But it bridged us didn't discriminate. For different reasons, we both understood struggle. So we kept talking, about 30 minutes passed by. Unfortunately, I had to go back to class. And uh, I said, uh, hey, Kenny, like, you wanna walk up to the college mart so I can get you some food and drinks? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be great. Yeah, let's do it. I, I, I'll walk with you. I said, okay, awesome. Next question. One second later. Hey, hey, can you get me some cigarettes? But, but I don't smoke. I'm thinking, okay. All right, Kenny, I'm trying to get you some food, man. You want cigarettes? And uh, this is one of the heaviest, you know, doses of perspective I've ever received. And uh, Kenny said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't smoke. But cigarettes are like gold down at the mission. I can sell each one for $2. Oh, man. <sighs> if I didn't feel bad enough already. And so uh, I share that story with you and also just uh, another little side note, but uh, along with perspective and um, the story of Kenny, I remember lying on the ground in Afghanistan. The Marine Corps didn't love us enough yet to give us cots uh, or, or pillows to sleep on. So, uh, you know, seven-month deployments, 
no shower, sleeping on the ground in the dirt. And I'm lying there, looking up at the sky, and I see the most normal but bizarre picture I might have ever seen. And that was a commercial plane flying overhead. I thought, what? Me and my Marines are sitting here fighting every day from sun up to sundown. We had already lost Marines. And here were people, hopefully smelling a little better than us, but here were people 30,000 feet up, yes, but I could see them. And if they looked out their window, they could see us too. And I just realized that you never see the full picture. You never see what the guy beside you or the girl beside you. Bert, any of you up there, just because you see people, are you really seeing people? Are you taking that time to care and just ask, you know, not how are you, but hey, is everything okay? You seem a little down and out today. Never, just like me, thinking that Kenny was going to follow up and ask for money, or I thought he wanted cigarettes, you know, trying to, trying to fake me out and get cigarettes, and, and then I get smacked in the face with the heavy hand of karma for even thinking that. And so are you really seeing people? As I thought about... Uh, I mean, you can never over-prepare, but as I thought about for many weeks, how I would tie in, you know, I was just thinking story after story. Okay, strong roots. Ah, well, no, nah, that one doesn't really fit. Well, maybe this one. And cycling through stories or lessons. And about after two or three weeks of this, probably two nights ago, midnight, cut the TV off, you know, going to bed. Bam, it hit me. So I got up, and at midnight, I was two pages in the notes, and I realized that if I didn't somewhat, but if all the people from my journey, football coaches, that pushed me on the playing fields. Teachers that said they would, I'm terrible at math, teachers that would, said they'd sit there and, and do math with me after school for 30 minutes. Good friends and people that love and support me. It was like right there in my face. It was so obvious that if I wouldn't have had strong roots, whether it was being raised or from the blast on, I wouldn't be here. And you think strong roots, just like on this shirt. Obviously, the deeper the roots, the better. But at the same time, we don't have to have the deepest roots. Again, like at that kitchen counter, you don't have to be a master at what you're doing. You don't have to know the next step or the perfect plan. But as long as your roots are diverse and connected to so many around you from different walks of life, from different ages, from different families and groups and organizations, that's what makes you strong. Not what you know, or not, you know, how tough you are. No, 
all of those amazing lessons that get you through the adversity and that, you know, get you to that next day and, and pick you up and, and, and keep you strong. You know, that comes from, you know, other people taking the time, teaching you, loving you, establishing those roots so that when you get knocked down or you get hit by a grenade or you step on an IED or you have a motorcycle wreck, the roots are there. You don't necessarily even have to, to you know, spend time worrying too much about the game plan. The last thing uh, and what I want to end with is people ask me all the time, oh, do you remember the grenade? Uh, you know, what did it look like? I've even got the question, was it an enemy grenade? I'm like, nah, me and my buddies were playing hot potato and I lost. Like, <laughs> yes, it was an enemy grenade. I would not be up here proud of my service and what I did if I accidentally hit myself with my own grenade and then jumped on it. And then jumped on it. And so, uh, you know, and years and years ago in the beginning, I used to get frustrated because I couldn't remember. But then I just started to try to reshape my thinking and that it was, who cares if I didn't remember? I mean, there were eyewitnesses, but who, who cares if they weren't? Like, I'm here, you know, thankfully my buddy's still alive and we're both just figuring it out. So who cares? But the whole country and some of the world, the Department of Defense, for years, hundreds of pages, you know, everyone, the news, wanted to know about the five seconds of my life, the only five seconds that I couldn't remember. So it was frustrating. But I came to peace with not being able to remember. Moved on, whatever. As the years went on, though, I couldn't help but to still wonder, even though I don't remember, how or why could, could someone do what they do? Or, you know, do what I did, I guess. And the strong roots, you know, plays a, a major part in that. But as I really thought about it, time went on, I realized that I was kind of self-centeredly thinking about it. Like, oh, why would I do this? Oh, how did I do that? Because still, 11 years later, I cannot believe, I cannot fathom. It's still mind-blowing, just as much to me as it is you, uh, that I covered a uh, uh, hand grenade, which I don't recommend whatsoever. <laughs> um, but... You know, I, I realized that I was just thinking, me, me, I, I. There's Marines that have covered grenades for their fellow Marines since 2001 and 9-11 and the war on terror. There's those that I am so forever just humbled to be in their presence, the Medal of Honor Society, they are still living recipients from Vietnam and Korea, covered hand grenades for their fellow troops and service members. One of my first interviews or uh, you know, media type things that I ever did was uh, many years ago, uh, Reader's Digest. And I was a couple stories in, but they were profiling heroic people. And the article on the page before me was a school teacher from the Midwest. And during a, I mean, extremely severe, it was either F4, F5 tornado, she got all the students she could and laid on top of them as the building was collapsing. 
And so I realized that take the names out of those heroic stories. And that is where I got my answer. And that is the beauty of the human spirit. That you never know how, when, or to what capacity you're going to step up and not just be a hero, but a life-saving hero for those around you. Again, I am so honored to have been with you tonight. I thank you. Bert, you keep sitting. I'm running the show now. But no, thank you. Thank you.